The title of this evening's uh, lesson is Farming in the Kingdom of God. Farming in the Kingdom of God. Isn't that strange? I, who only saw his first cow when he was 13 years old, up close, and preaching a sermon entitled Farming in the Kingdom of God, right? <laughs> well, like Jesus, Paul the Apostle used a lot of illustrations to explain the, um, the inner workings of God's kingdom uh, and the spiritual world, and that's where I'm uh, taking this analogy from. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he starts by comparing working in the kingdom of heaven on earth, with, which is the church, to working on a farm. And I think the reason he does this is to help us understand in a practical way what our ministries in the church actually mean in relation to the, to the big picture. You know, it's easy to become frustrated and discouraged if we don't see how what we are doing in a very specific area of the church, how that fits into the whole. If we don't understand what we are doing, how it contributes, it becomes very discouraging at times. I think that's why smart companies give employees orientation training in the goals and overall operation of their business so that the individual employee can see the place and the importance that his or her contribution makes you know, to the final product. And so Paul is, is doing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 by explaining the overall cycle that must take place in the normal development of the church, any church, meaning any congregation. In doing so, he was hoping to dispel feelings of pride or, at the opposite end, feelings of despair felt by various individuals because they happened to be at some high or low point in the normal cycle of church growth. Sometimes you're on a high, things are going great, and man, look at what we're doing, you know, and then, and then you get to the low point and you, you, you become despairing and you wonder, well, is there anything I can do to make this better? So Paul is trying to get these two, you know, the high and the low points, into some sort of perspective. And he chooses the farming illustration to explain this because his readers would easily understand this imagery since farming was the oldest of cycles known to man. So with the farm model he explains the natural evolution of growth in the church and how each plays an important part for that growth to happen. And so farming in the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 3. Let's start, read with me please, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? And so he doesn't start right away with the farming idea. He begins actually by rebuking his readers for their immature attitude. He compares them to spiritual babies who are not ready to begin eating a regular diet of mature spiritual food, grown-up food, he calls it. And the reason for this rebuke is that they're jealous of one another and they're dividing into various factions and, and groups. Paul says that in doing this, they were worse than spiritual babes, they are mere men or unspiritual men, in other words, men without God's spirit, quite a rebuke. Now the reason for their jealousy and division was that they were aligning themselves with different church leaders and they were claiming that their work and their success was their own. It's a little bit like being you know, an OU fan versus an OSU fan, claiming that their team's victory is their team. Yeah, look what we did. 
wait a minute, you, what, what did you do? You sat on the couch eating Cheezos. <laughs> you know, yeah, my team all the way, really. A Little bit of this was going on in the church. Look at my man, yeah, we're doing it. And so in response to this partisanship, Paul explains the true role of these people as equal servants in a cycle of growth begun and maintained by God. In explaining the tasks that he and Apollos, who was at the time a great orator, a great preacher, Paul establishes a model for all future workers to refer to when they begin comparing what they are doing to the overall work and growth of the church. So he continues in verse five and he says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. He says that all workers, regardless of their task or where they are in the cycle of growth, all of the workers are, are equal because all of them are working towards the same end, and that is producing faith in Jesus Christ in the hearts of other people. No matter who you are, he says, no matter where you are on the growth cycle, the objective's always the same, that through your combined effort, others will believe in Jesus Christ. There's no reason to take any pride in that. And no worker can boast since the opportunity to serve, the tools to serve with, and later uh, he's going to say even the results are all there provided by God. Who gave them the gospel? Well, God gave them the gospel. And who gave them the various gifts that they had, whatever gifts they had? Who gave that to them? Well, the Spirit gave them to them. And, 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 and who provided the results? Well, God provides the results. And so no servant, therefore, can boast because all of us begin with nothing and all are, complete, and all are completely uh, equipped, if you wish, for service by God. So by implication, Paul is telling his readers that if he and Apollos, if they cannot boast, then neither can their so-called followers boast. He goes on in verse six to say, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. And so in verse six, he applies the cycle found in farming and gardening to the cycle of growth that we experience in God's kingdom here on earth, earth which is the church. He mentions three phases in that cycle, and the fact that each one represents a place and a type of work that we find ourselves in as Christians serving in the church of our Lord. In other words, the cycle then is the same as the cycle now. No difference. We experience the same thing. So to review that, first phase of the cycle, he says, is the planting. I mean, there's no crop without first the seeds being sown into the earth. Anybody who has a garden knows that. In the church, sowing of seed or planting is essentially spreading the gospel to all nations. I mean, this Jesus alludes, uh, alluded in the uh, parable of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter four. As a matter of fact, he even says in verse 14, the sower sows the word by way of explaining the parable to his disciples. And so the planting time is sowing the seed. Now, the Lord also made this to be his basic command as the first task of the apostles after his resurrection. In Mark 16, uh, verse 15, he says, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to all creation. Why? Well, there's no harvest if there's no seed planting. You've got to plant the seed. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this seed planting. I mean, missionaries who go into foreign countries, they learn another language, 
they write, they produce whatever, videos, tapes, whatever, they knock on doors, they hand out literature, they, they teach people how to speak English, you know, so many ways to sow the seed through mission work, advertising, uh, Bible correspondence courses, radio, television, more recently, of course, the internet, visitation programs, VBS. What do you think VBS is? It's the planting of the seed into the young hearts of our children here in our congregation, and if, and if we are working hard, the children that those children will bring. It's a seed planting. Some people say, you know what, well, I've never seen a baptism at VBS. Well, I have, but I've never seen a little kid come up and you know, four years old or five years old say, I want to be baptized. You know, no, I haven't seen that. But I've seen a lot of children who have gone to VBS year after year after year finally confess Christ one Sunday and say, wow, where did that come from? Well, where do you think it came from? You've been planting seed in that little kid for years. So every effort to bring the gospel to those who have not heard it before, that's part of the, that's part of the planting effort. Hal is telling me this morning, you know, my class was on video because I was preaching elsewhere this morning, so my first class, and he said, do you realize that there's more people listening to your class online than in person? Seed sowing, and I said, great. I don't care how the seed gets sown, as long as it gets sown. So planting this part of the cycle, well, I have to tell you, it's hard work. It's, it's uphill type of work. You need great faith and you have to be able to work with very little encouragement, and you have to be ready not to receive a whole lot of credit for what you've done, because you're just planting seed. It's usually lonely kind of work, because you labor with a hope and a vision that only a few people can see. Abraham and Noah and the Apostle Paul, they were seed planters and they set an example for modern day seed sowers even in our congregation. You know, I can mention a name. I, I saw Opal Gibson's daughter today. Some of you know who I'm talking about here. Opal Gibson was on the front pew of the gospel, first gospel meeting that they had here in 1939. She was, and love to say, those of you who knew her, you know, the first member of the Choctaw Church of Christ. And her daughter reminded me of that. And the Larisons, another early family. And the elders at Capitol Hill. You know what's interesting? The Capitol Hill Church, in Oklahoma City, almost 75 years ago, spent the money to hire a person to come to Choctaw to have a gospel meeting, and they paid for the tent and all that stuff. Their vision, you know, their seed planting got us to here. Here's what's interesting. This week I was negotiating with a man, a brother, his name is Pablo Jabez. And Pablo Jabez is going to translate Christianity for Beginners, the, the, the video that I've made in English and French, he's going to translate it into Spanish. Do you know for who? For the Capitol Hill Church, because now Capitol Hill Church is an inner city church with a lot of Hispanic speaking members. See how the, the cycle goes round and round and round? Of course, the reward for visionaries is a faith that is rock solid as a result of the vision that they have received in serving the kingdom. Yeah, it's hard work, it's visionary work, it's slow, there's not a whole lot of reward you know, planting the seed, but the main reward you get is that God strengthens your faith, and that in itself is a reward. In the end, the planters, the sowers, the visionaries, 
feel close to God and are continually and easily filled with awe and praise as we see in Paul's writings where he spontaneously, he breaks out in praise and joy. Why? Because his work was going so well, excuse me, he was getting beat up, he was getting whipped, he was getting thrown into jail. No, his praise was spontaneous because his faith was like a mountain. It was undeniable. It burst through all of the hardship that he faced. This is the true spirit of planters and seed sowers. The next cycle that Paul talks about is the watering. Paul claims that Apollos, he was a waterer, a nourisher, a builder-upper. This is usually the longest stage in the cycle of farming and it's also the longest stage in church growth. The seed is planted with hard work to break up the soil and remove the debris. Then the farmer waits patiently for the rain to nourish the seed and the sun to bring it forth. In the church, this watering stage involves many things. Organizing, ministering to others, persevering in a task, teaching Bible school year in, year out, you know, year in and year out. How many of our teachers have been, te how long have you been teaching that class? You know, I think of Miss Debbie, how many years is she? Miss Nisi, you know, how many years have, I mean, the, the kids are getting married and having their own children and bringing them back to the teachers that taught them at the beginning. Building buildings, training teachers, helping ministers to mature. Watering also includes the work of strengthening families and developing leaders and establishing good community relationships. Planting is hard, watering is tedious. It's slow, it's grinding, sometimes it's repetitious, it's monotonous at times, over and over and over again. It's discouraging also because it is often a case of one step forward and two steps back. There are many late nights, many large responsibilities and sacrifices, and not a whole lot of gratitude from your students at the time. People like Solomon who consolidated David his father's gains and later spent decades building an elaborate temple. You know, we want to build something, we want to do it in like 30 days, you know, 42 days. We're talking decades here to build something. People like Barnabas, the early mentor of Paul and later Mark, he was a waterer. The Apostle John, who had little movement in his ministry, but remained a long time in teaching and building up the church in Ephesus and, and Asia Minor, receiving his great visions near the, near the end of his life. You know, we, have, we have these kinds of servants today in our church. Elders who serve with their wives and keep a steady hand for years. You know, I'm surprised that Brother Harold's not here, but you know, I mean, Brother Harold's been an elder longer than I've been a Christian. And so many others. I remember Johnny was an elder when I first got here. He looked old then, but now, man. <laughs> Whew. Deacons who work hard with little recognition. Teachers and ministers who are there day in and day out. Secretaries who do the work day in and day out. 52, well maybe 51 bulletins a year. To the point that we take them for granted. They're always there. They're always there when we need them. And those brothers and sisters who are responsible for a thousand acts of kindness in visiting the sick and preparing food and serving in childcare, they are the quiet waterers that continually nourish the church. I've not even mentioned all who deserve to be mentioned, only a few to help you understand the kind of person and the kind of work that watering is all about. Now the reward for waterers is that their work etches into their own character over time. And you begin to see the true markings of hope and strength and the most precious of virtues, 
godly humility. Waterers feel close to God's people and they know His ways intimately. This is what gives them great confidence for the future and a hope that cannot be shaken. And then there's the harvest, third phase in the cycle. Jesus promised that those who are faithful to sow seed and work the soil will have a harvest of some kind. We always think 100%, but He didn't say that. Sometimes 30-fold, sometimes 60, some, sometimes 100. And the work of harvesting includes obviously baptizing souls who are coming to Christ. Managing the growth that are caused by years of work by others. You know, operating Christian schools, writing books, organizing great demonstrations of praise and, and worship. Planning for the next plateau of growth in large churches. Funding other good works to glorify God. Boy, there's a harvest. You've got so much money that you're able, you're able to take some of it and start someone else working. That's, that's harvesting. But harvesting, like everything else, has its own unique set of challenges. You are the steward of the hard work of others and receive little credit for what you have. Nobody says you did it. You're, you're just harvesting what somebody else did. And many times you're judged and compared to others who came before you. You have to cope with new problems that have not been, been faced before. People like Joshua, who took over from Moses and settled a land already subdued by others, was one who worked a harvest period. And Peter, along with the other apostles, enjoyed a great harvest from Jesus' ministry, but had the task of leading the early church through the first difficult years of its existence. Today, our present elders and deacons are very much into this phase as they strive to find the direction and new goals uh, to reach based on the achievements of the past generation. Of course, there is a reward for the harvesters as well. Their task is a joyful task. Uh, when I came in on the Monday, Monday's my day off, and it seems that you know, uh, Marty does all his baptizing on Monday these days, so, but you should have seen his face. You know, I came into the office on Tuesday and said, so he, we're talking and he says, so, uh, so what'd you do? He says to me, what'd you do this weekend? Well, you know, I played golf and oh, my back was hurting this weekend and I think I did this and you know, just nonsense stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know. And I went on and on and on about it. You know, and then I said, so what'd you do? He said, oh, I baptized five people yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, smarty. <laughs> yeah, the task they have is a joyful task, a happy task. They have many resources to work with. I remember you know, leaving Montreal, the tiny little church in Montreal, and then coming to work uh, for a large church. Whoa, what a difference. Wow, you know, in, in a small church, you know, you're offering you know, $300 a week. You know, well, there's not a lot you can do with 300 bucks a week. You, know? you go to a church, they're offering $30,000 a week or something. Wow, all the things that you can do with that. So there's a great joy. And harvesters have the blessing of seeing God's power at work. They're seeing it, not with the eyes of faith. They're just seeing it there and now. And so harvesters get an early taste of heaven and experience the pleasure of having a continually thankful heart. Well, now that we've had a kind of a bird's eye view of this model of growth, let's draw a couple of practical lessons for our own situation here today as we follow in Jesus' footsteps in doing the work of the kingdom here in Choctaw, because I could stop the lesson here. Good lesson, I think, I hope. You know, oh yeah, well that's how it works, and yeah, there's some insights there. But come on, you know me. I like to talk about the elephant in the room, right? Let's kind of bring this home. Lesson number one that we need to remember based on this model here. 
let's remember that church work and church growth is cyclical. Okay? It's, not, it's not like this, you start low and it goes high, it's cyclical. No one person or no one congregation is exclusively in one place. We go from one stage to another in our personal ministries as well as the development of the congregation. Knowing this helps us not become too proud when we're on a high harvest point or too discouraged so we don't get into a rut. Because it's a cycle, we should always be prepared for change and learn to be flexible in order to accommodate the various phases in the life of a congregation. It's cyclical. Lesson number two. Lesson number two is know where you are in the cycle. A church with empty pews should not waste its time on a building program. A church with crowded classrooms needs both a building program and a teacher training program. You, get, you see what I'm saying here? Wise leaders learn to discern where the congregation is in the cycle and they plan for the next level. They need to be able to see that. This breeds confidence in the leadership and a clear direction for the congregation. Now in my opinion, you know, I mean, it, it's, the question is being begged here. In my opinion, I would say, someone would say, well, where are we at? What do you think? It's only one person's opinion. But in my opinion, I would say that our congregation here at Choctaw has gone through a long harvesting period where new elders and deacons were appointed and families matured and much of our indebtedness was lowered. The congregation has grown comfortable. I think we may be getting just a little too comfortable, however, living off of the past harvests. We've had lots of harvests. And brothers and sisters, that's not very wise to just be living off your savings, living off your harvests. It's not wise in farming and it's not wise in church work either. We need to be considering ways to plant seeds. We need to be considering ways to set goals. We need to be thinking about investing in the future to prepare the way for the next generation of Christians here at Choctaw. We need to have the kind of vision that the people had in Capitol Hill 75 years ago. We need to have, because you know what, I would have loved to have been at one of those meetings there when somebody brought up the bright idea of going out into the boondocks in Choctaw of all places and spending good money <laughs> having a gospel meeting out there we have to pay for a guy, pay for the tent, pay for the refreshments. We have to drag ourselves all the way out to Choctaw. I would have loved to have been at that meeting when the elders took the vote. Because the underlying question of the negativos would have been, well, there's nothing in it for us. What's in it for us? What are we getting out of this? 75 years ago, people we hardly know or remember planted seed with the thought that in the future, people they would probably never meet would have a harvest. And we're those people. And we have harvested their seed planting for a long time. I think it's our turn to do the very same thing for a generation that we will only meet in heaven. But who we serve here on earth now. Lesson number three. Jesus Christ is the Lord of every harvest. Paul says it in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 this time. He says, so then, 
Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Paul reminds them that no matter where we are in the cycle and what task has been assigned to us, the Lord is the one who will cause the seed to grow. And then he reassures them that each point in the cycle, each task performed is exactly the same in God's eyes. Seed planters have no greater glory than waterers or harvesters. They are all equal tasks in the eyes of God. He will reward based on how you worked, not what you worked at. For example, if you served well keeping the nursery, you will be rewarded. If you neglected your responsibility in mowing the grass, you will receive your due. Finally, in verse nine, Paul explains that while you are busy working at your ministry, whatever that is, at whatever point in the cycle, God is busy working on you. Your theater of operation is this world and the task is to fill it with the knowledge of Christ. His theater of operation is your heart and His task is to fill it with the love of Christ through the Holy Spirit. You see, as you work for Him in this world, He is at work to prepare you for the world to come, because this also is part of the cycle. So I ask you as we close out this evening, where are you at, not in the cycle of church growth, where are you in the cycle of your life? Is it the endless cycle of sin and shame and failure? Then I encourage you, why not break out of this rut and cycle and come to Christ today, that He might set you free from guilt and fear and begin the cycle of love and joy and anticipation of heaven rather than the dread of condemnation. If you want to be free, then I encourage you to come to Jesus now by repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and of course being buried in the waters of baptism to wash away the old cycle of sin and death and begin a new cycle of life and joy. And if your cycle has been unfaithfulness and you desire to change that cycle and begin a cycle of faithfulness rather than unfaithfulness, then I encourage you, repent, change the cycle, Begin this night to be faithful in your service and your adoration and your walk with Jesus Christ. Won't you do that as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.